Kia ora and welcome from wherever you are to today's conversation about vectors. I hope you are well and I'm looking forward to beginning our exploration of vectors together with you. At their absolute essence, vectors are simply a list of numbers. We normally write them down vertically, surrounded by brackets, like this. In and of itself, this list of numbers doesn't really mean all that much. However, we can introduce meaning by giving these numbers context. A vector with three entries could represent a point in space, where the numbers are the x, y, and z coordinates of the point. Or, a vector with 24 entries could be the temperature in your city measured throughout the day. Three-dimensional ones are really common because they can model things like forces, velocities, and accelerations in the real world. But our vectors are certainly not limited to being useful for just these kinds of things. With only a list of numbers definition, there isn't really very much that we can do with our vectors. What we want to do is to define some mathematics that we can perform with them that will be meaningful and useful. We'll start with one of the first operations we learned how to do with regular numbers, addition. The most useful model of a vector to help us understand addition is the one where we think of a vector as an arrow. E.g. the vector 1, 2 can be interpreted as an arrow that goes right 1 and up 2. Similarly, the vector negative 3, 2 can be interpreted as go left 3 and up 2. So, how about we define our vector addition to be what we get if we do these two operations in succession, i.e. we'll define the vector 1, 2 plus minus 3, 2 to be go right 1 up 2, then left 3, and up 2, which overall is go left 2 and up 4, or minus 2, 4. Pictorially, you can do this by taking your two arrows and lining them up so that the second one starts where the first one ends. The overall vector starting at the tail of the first and ending at the head of the second is our vector sum. So we can write our sum as follows, 1, 2 plus negative 3, 2 equals negative 2, 4. We can see that we can actually get this result without having to do the steps in our heads by just adding the corresponding vector components together. And we can make what we've just done mathematically precise by writing down a general formula for vector addition for two arbitrary vectors of the same size. We start with defining our vectors. Let A, B be elements of Rn. This just says that A and B are part of the family of vectors with n real entries. That's what the R means. Note we usually use lowercase bold letters for vectors or underlined if handwritten. Then we define A plus B equals A1, A2 through to An plus B1, B2 through to Bn, which equals A1 plus B1, A2 plus B2 through to An plus Bn. We have a nice mathematical construction now that we know has the right meaning when we consider the vectors in question to be geometrical arrows. The next operation that we want to focus on is that of stretching our vectors. Imagine we take a vector 1, 2 and we stretch it out to double its length. Hopefully you can convince yourself that this vector is 2, 4. It might help to draw the two vectors on a page as arrows starting from the same spot. So to double our vector, we just multiplied each entry by 2. We call this operation scalar multiplication, and just like we did with addition, we can define it mathematically. So let u be a vector in Rn, and a be a real number. Then we define a times u is equal to a times the vector u1, u2, through to un, which is equal to the vector a times u1, a times u2, through to a times un. Notice that this definition allows for multiplication by negative numbers as well, because r is the set of all real numbers, numbers on the number line. So if a is negative, what happens is the direction of the vector is reversed. Now I've built a little applet in GeoGebra that you can play with to experiment with what happens as the scalar is varied. Notice that negative values of the scalar correspond to a backwards pointing vector. In particular, minus x is the vector x flipped around to point in the opposite direction. Okay, so we did addition and scalar multiplication, but it seems like we've forgotten something. What do we do about vector subtraction? 
Well, here's where the power of working in a slightly more abstract way comes in. We can do a tiny bit of algebra, and we can see that a minus b equals a plus negative b. So actually, subtraction is just the addition of one vector with the negative of the other. Subtraction also has a very natu natural geometrical interpretation. We'll take the vectors a and b, and we'll draw them starting from the origin, 0, 0. We can draw negative b, and then form a plus negative b using head to tail addition as before. But notice that the resultant vector can actually be repositioned to join a and b together. Looking at the picture, you can see that a, b, and the shifted version of a minus b form a triangle. So they should obey the head to tail addition law. The vectors b and a minus b form a sequence of arrows that should be equivalent to a. And sure enough, if we do this algebraically, b plus a minus b is a, as we hoped. OK, now we've established a few basic operations. We can add and subtract vectors and stretch them to our wills. We're sticking with the interpretation of vectors as geometrical objects for now, because a lot of the math that we'll develop is easiest to understand in this context. A very natural thing for us to want to know is how to calculate the length of a vector. We call this the norm of the vector, and we write it as a vector x with two bars on each side. Remember, vectors have meaning other than geometry, so the word length might not always be meaningful. So let's start with 2D. We can draw a right angle triangle with our vector along the hypotenuse and the two components as the other sides. Then we can use Pythagoras' theorem to find the length of it. For example, if our vector is x equals negative 3, 4, then we can calculate its length as length of x, or the norm of x, is equal to the square root of negative 3 squared plus 4 squared, which equals 5. Notice that I included the negative sign inside the formula, even though it will be squared away. I could have written length of x is equal to the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, but the advantage of the first one is that I can just put the vector component minus 3 straight in. OK, what about 3D? Let's try and figure out the length of the vector u equals negative 3, 4, 12. First, we can split this into two vectors. u is equal to negative 3, 4, 0, plus 0, 0, 12. The first ve vector sits in the xy plane and has length 5. We just figured that out. The z component of 0 doesn't really do anything. And the second is at right angles to it and has length 12. Because the two vectors form a right angled triangle with u, we can again use Pythagoras' theorem to figure out the overall length. So the length of u is the square root of the length of the vector negative 3, 4, 0 squared, plus the length of the vector 0, 0, 12 squared, which is the, squ the square root of 5 squared plus 12 squared, which in turn is the square root of minus 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 12 squared, which is the square root of 169, which just so happens to be 13. Notice that I used our previous example to turn the 5 squared into negative 3 squared plus 4 squared. So overall, the length of our vector is once again just the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. This works for any vector in three dimensions, and we'll take this as the definition for vectors with more than three components as well. So mathematically, let x be a vector in Rn, then the norm of x is defined to be the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way up to xn squared. Notice that this is the positive square root, and what's inside is always positive, or zero if all the components are zero. So the length of the vector is always non-negative. We can write this in a slightly more formal math speak way as the length of x is greater than or equal to zero and the length of x equals 0 if and only if x is equal to 0 itself. We've got to be a little bit careful here because we've defined a length or a norm operation, but actually we've already talked about scalar multiplication as something that scales the length of a vector <laughs> before we even knew what the length was. <laughs> We'd better check that our scalar multiplication operation is actually compatible with our length definition.
So the following things ought to be true. It should be true that the norm of AX should equal A times the norm of X if A is greater than or equal to zero. And the norm of AX should be negative A times the norm of X if A is negative. This is because if our scalar is negative, we don't want to multiply our length by a negative number, hence the negative sign. These two statements can actually be combi combined into one. The length of a times x is equal to the absolute value of a times the norm of x, using our absolute value function which removes the negative sign if there is one. So let's try it out. What we'll do is we'll start with the norm of ax, and we'll try and do manipulations that will have us end up at our right hand side, absolute value of a times norm of x. So this should be our first proof. Um, to start off a proof, we need to define the bits and pieces involved. So let x be a vector in Rn, and let a be a real number. This just defines x and a in general. Then using our definition of scalar multiplication, ax is just the vector ax1, ax2 through to axn. So we'll put this vector in our norm formula. The length of ax, or the norm of ax, is equal to the square root of ax1 squared plus ax2 squared all the way through to plus axn squared. I've just substituted in the entries of the scalar multiplied vector ax into our length formula. Let's expand out the inner parentheses with the goal of getting this a outside of our square root. So that equals the square root of a squared x1 squared plus a, a squared x2 squared all the way through to a squared xn squared. Notice I jumped straight in with the equals sign, continuing my previous line. Each term inside the square root has a common factor of a squared, so let's factorize the inside. So that equals the square root of a squared times x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way up to xn squared. Now remember that if we have the square root of a product of positive numbers, the square root of xy is equal to the square root of x square root of y. So we can continue here as this is equal to the square root of a squared times the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared plus up to xn squared. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Now don't be tempted to write the square root of a squared equals a, because that's not true if a is negative. The correct statement is the square root of a squared is equal to the absolute value of a, as the square root is always non-negative. And the other term is just the length of x, or the norm of x. So we did it. We better finish though. So that equals absolute value of a times the norm of x, which is exactly what we wanted. Now it's very common that we want to produce a vector that points in a particular direction that has a norm or a length of 1. Now that we know about norms and scalar multiplication, this is actually pretty straightforward. We'll often put a little hat on our, vectors, on our vector, like u hat, to indicate that they are unit vectors, but this is just a convention, not a rule. We can turn a vector u into a unit vector u hat by simply multiplying by 1 over its length, or dividing by its length. So u hat is equal to 1 over the length of u times the vector u itself. For example, a unit vector in the direction of u equals negative 3, 4 would be 1 over 5 times negative 3, 4, which we could write as negative 3, 5, and 4, negative 3 over 5, sorry, and 4 over 5. This process is often called normalization, so we just normalized our vector. In two dimensions, it's also pretty common to want a unit vector at a certain angle theta counterclockwise from the x-axis. In this case, we can draw a right angled triangle with hypotenuse 1 and observe that the x and y components are just cos theta, or cosine theta, and sine theta, respectively. So our vector u is just cosine theta, sine theta. You might want to check for yourself using our norm formula that this does indeed have length 1. If our vector needed a certain length, we could just multiply this out the front. So let's produce a vector in R2 of length 7 at an angle 120 degrees from the x-axis. So this should be a is equal to 7 times the vector cosine 120 degrees, sine 120 degrees, which equals 7 times negative a half and square root 3 over 2, which is equal to 7 over 2 times negative 1 square root 3.
The last couple of steps were just to find a tidy way of writing this down. So, we've covered quite a bit of ground in this video with some of the fundamental tools of operating with vectors. You'll be very surprised how many problems you can now attack with even just these basic operations. So take care for now. Kakite ano oia koutou.